a specific panel. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Rianne Sapia. Uh, she works at CRD as an environmental science officer and uh, has done a number of uh, very interesting things, such as running low impact uh, development workshops with them. Um, she's going to talk a little more about herself, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. I'll let her do that. Um, but if everyone can uh, welcome uh, Rianne up here. And, uh, Thank you so much, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today, and I'm really happy to have been able to see Marsha's presentation first just to get a better idea of how uh, Living Building Challenge really has been changing building buildings. Um, I'm with the Stormwater Harbors and Watersheds Program, and part of my role at the CRD is to work with um, municipalities and members of the public to promote practices, policies, and behavior changes that are, will help restore and protect our waterways, harbors, and watersheds and the near shore marine environment. So in the context of the Living Building Challenge, my focus really is about the water puddle. And before I was invited to speak, I didn't really have a great idea of what the Living Building Challenge was all about. Um, so the more I read about it, the more I realized that really there are so many more linkages to the other pedals like energy, sight, beauty, and the health pedal as well. And I know that many of you here are already familiar with a lot of the topics I'm going to be talking about today, but what I really want to focus on is the idea that it's really important to design within the context of the watershed, and it's really important to consider the watershed scale in designs. So a watershed is the area of land that drains rainfall, snow melt, sediment, dissolved materials, all to a particular water body, such as a stream, a river, a lake, a reservoir, or the marine environment. And this map is a water, uh, map of all of the watersheds in the CRD, and there are actually over 300 watersheds. They range from the nearly untouched watersheds that are in the one of Cuba. Um, it's mainly urbanized, and there's actually really only a very small open channel. Um, one slogan that I really like for watershed outreach is that we all live on waterfront property. And really we do because everything in the watershed is connected. And when something runs off a property, it will eventually make its way downstream and into the receiving environment. And the reason it's really important to consider watersheds when designing a site is because it's how we develop our land and our land use practices that have a big impact on the health of our watersheds and water quality. In a natural watershed, the hydrology looks something like the image on the right here, where when rain falls, uh, the majority is intercepted by the forest canopy and a large proportion is evapotranspired. And the water that does make it to the ground infiltrates into the deep groundwater or travels below the surface as interflow. And really, only a very small proportion of it travels over land as surface runoff. But the more we develop our land, the hydrology of the watersheds can drastically change. And that means that the amount of water that evapotranspires, that infiltrates uh, recharge groundwater, is, or to become uh, interflow, is significantly reduced. And also, a much greater proportion of water travels over land as surface runoff. So the altered landscape and the additional runoff really do have a huge impact on the health of our watersheds. So why do we care about healthy watersheds? It's because healthy functioning watersheds provide really valuable ecosystem services. Services that the environment provides naturally and for free are really, really costly to replicate through engineering. So things like biodiversity of plants, insects, wildlife, and birds, habitat and green corridors which provide connectivity for wildlife, management of rainfall and the storage and really slow release of water over time which helps us to maintain our stream flows and dry conditions, cleaner air and cleaner water, opportunities for recreation that contribute to our health and well-being, as well as conditions and sites for biochemical reactions and the assimilation of wastes. But when we cover a watershed with impervious area, we drastically change the hydrograph. 
pre-development, the flow is much more gradual over time, and much of it is detained and infiltrated and slowly released over time. But post-development, as you can oops, see here, there we go. Um, the flow rate off the land is much, much quicker, and that means that um, it's discharged quickly into creeks and streams in the near to marine environment. So, for example, in the Bowker Creek watershed, within six hours of a rainfall, all of that water has already made it off of the land into the stormwater system, through the creek, and into the marine environment. Whereas in a natural watershed, that could take something like six weeks. So as we cover and pave over more of our natural areas, it means we have more and more water that needs to be managed, that has to go somewhere. And the way we have been managing that is by collecting it in curbs and gutters, funneling it into the stormwater system, and then usually, most often, it is untreated going into our um, nearest water bodies. And basically, we are trying to get it off the land as quickly as possible. So what that has resulted in is the, the need for us to do this channelization and hardening of our urban streams so that they can handle that excess velocity and the excess volume of water going through. But when we take away the ability of a watershed to moderate the runoff, uh, it means during more intense storm events, like a 50-year storm here, we see flooding and we see erosion in our streams habitat destruction and sometimes the systems just can't handle all those flows. We also see the litter of pollutants carried off the land and discharged into the environment and there are often greater than environmental impacts, also economic and cultural impacts like the closing of shellfish harvesting. And we always have this challenge of how do we prevent the pollution that's happening on our land. <coughs> So there is another layer of complexity to think about here, and that is, what is to come with a change in climate? So climate change mitigation, everyone knows, is about uh, reducing the amount of energy we consume, but clim climate change adaptation is going to be all about how we're going to be managing these excess flows. And according to the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, we can expect to see an increase in winter precipitation, decrease in summer rainfall, an increase in the frequency and intensity of our storm events by as much as 15% by 2050, and sea level rises and a corresponding increase in storm surges. And we all know we already have a severe infrastructure deficit all across Canada, do, and uh, really the question is, can our infrastructure handle that increase in precipitation? Well, do, uh, according to the uh, Round table on the, or National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy, by 2020, climate change impacts are predicted to cost about $20 billion per year. And by 2050, it could be double that. And so really we have to think about, is the best way to spend our money on creating bigger pipes to handle those flows? And I don't think that's the answer, because what we need to do is create a landscape that allows for full development of the site, but it functions more like a natural watershed, which allows us to take advantage of the ecosystem services provided for by a healthy functioning watershed. And it allows us to manage rainfall in a way that mimics pre-development hydrologies. So we are starting to do business differently, and it's especially because of drivers like the Living Building Challenge. That means moving away from this idea that stormwater is a waste to be managed and uh, more to the idea that rainwater is a resource that we need to protect. And that brings us to uh, green infrastructure and low impact development. So low impact development is a land use development strategy that emphasizes the protection and use of on-site natural features. It integrates uh, with engineered small-scale rainwater controls at the parcel and subdivision scale, and it manages rainwater or maintains and restores pre-development watershed hydrologic functions. So 
Because the idea behind Lone Pipe Development is not to be prescriptive, but instead allow the site to inform the way that water is managed. Key elements of Lone Pipe Development are conservation of native trees, vegetation, soils, the use of these small scale techniques that mimic the natural hydrology of the site, using site specific, specific designs, um, minimizing the amount of pollution and runoff from a site and ensuring that we're maintaining our best management practices properly, and allowing rainwater to infiltrate and recharge groundwater. LED techniques include um, features such as green roofs, rain gardens, downspout disconnection, permeable pavers, rainwater harvesting, green streets, land conservation, bioswales, tree planting, bioretention, and living walls as well. And by integrating low impact development and green structure into our designs, we can create these multifunctional landscapes that provide environmental protection and healthier ecosystems through increased habitat and biodiversity, we maintain natural processes, help to moderate our climate, clean our air and clean, clean our water. They provide cost savings through flood prevention and lots of recreational and educational opportunities. They improve aesthetics and increase property value, as well as a better connection to nature and many other functions. Green roofs are really becoming so much more commonplace in building designs, and I think that's because they're finally being recognized for all of the benefits that they have. So when rainwater falls on a green roof, what happens is the water is slowed, it's absorbed, and plants uptake the water, they evapotranspire, and help to cool the surrounding air. Some of the benefits are energy conservation, reducing the urban island heat, sorry, urban heat island effect. Um, they help manage rainwater, improve air quality, uh, they allow opportunities for urban agriculture, and increase real estate value, and of course, increase the lifespan of the roof. Green roofs do come in many shapes and sizes, and they can range in size from a institutional size roof, like this one on uh, at the University of Victoria, or a smaller uh, residential application, like this one at Oak Bay, or something like this tiny one in Victoria that is a roof on a studio in the backyard. The CRD building on Fiskard Street actually has the first monitored green roof in the capital region, and we partnered with BCIT to do pre and post monitoring uh, so we can get some real data on how the roof is performing in our climate. So before installation, we found that on a day that the ambient temperature was 30 degrees Celsius, the roof temperature was 60 degrees Celsius. So it's a great example of the urban heat island effect. Whereas when, when the green roof was installed on a day when the temperature was 30 degrees Celsius, the roof temperature was 30 degrees Celsius. So that means that we've had a huge impact on the cooling load of the building. And it is much, much nicer to look out your window and see a pretty green roof instead of an ugly gray roof. So during monitoring, we also found that uh, peak runoff from the, from the roof was reduced by 90% compared to the before monitoring, and it was delayed by two hours, which means that it greatly reduces those peak flows going into the stormwater system. So if you remember back to that graph, we can knock a little bit of that peak off the graph. And the City of Toronto, they have had an eco-roof incentive program going since 2009. They found that uh, in a study on their green roofs, the biodiversity of bird and insect species was actually roughly equivalent to that found at local green ground sites, which means that urban habitat <coughs> opportunities were being taken, uh, taken advantage of by the local wildlife. So an extensive green roof generally, generally looks something like this, meaning it's less than 15 centimeters in depth, and usually it can be grown in advance, allowing it to sort of be rolled up like sod and then um, easily transported and uh, very quickly installed. And they also have a much lighter uh, structural load compared to other types of green roofs, which makes them really useful for retrofits. 
For example, at the CRD building when we installed our green roof as a retrofit, we just had a very small amount of uh, additional structural capacity to use, so just, nine, uh, just 10 pounds <coughs> per square foot. And when we installed the green roof, uh, at its fully saturated weight, it's 9.9 per square foot, so we just came in under the wire. And uh, it was actually installed in just three days. So an intensive green roof has a soil depth of greater than the six inches, which means it's really great for urban agriculture. And uh, it does have a higher structural capacity, but it's great to be able to grow vegetables on your roof too. And this is pictures of our staff patio before, of course, it's this kind of Ugly, oh, sorry. Ugly gray, nothingness out there. And now we have vegetable gardens, there's fruit trees, there's native plants, there's herbs, and it is fantastic to use for barbecues. And, um, so trees provide tons of benefits for rainwater management. They help to intercept the rainfall, they increase infiltration and water storage by the root growth, and they reduce erosion by minimizing the impact of the rain falling into the soil. And the benefits go much further than that. They have uh, shade, they shade buildings to reduce the energy use, they reduce wind speeds, they improve air quality, absorb pollutants and particulates, and they provide habitat and reduction of noise pollution. But in the case of trees, uh, bigger is actually better, and the, light, the longer the lifespan of a tree, the greater the benefits are gonna be. And in the case of rainwater interception, a 56 centimeter double breastplate tree can intercept about 80% of a 25 millimeter storm for 24 hours, whereas a five centimeter tree can only intercept about 15%. So that's huge for, uh, in the case of Victoria, we get a lot of these smaller storms and we will really don't get that much rainfall over the 24 hour period. So that makes a huge difference on the demand and the impact on our stormwater systems. And it's really important for us to ensure that when planting the trees, they've got a lot of uncompacted soil and a sufficient water supply and it makes uh, the trees grow so much bigger. And living walls can be grown externally on the wall or on the surface of a building, or they can build, be built right into the surface uh, facade, just like this one at the Capital Regional District. And on this one, the plants were actually installed in these small trays, and it was really useful for making sure that the soil didn't move around too much. Uh, we did find, though, the benefits for rainwater management really are dependent on the weather and the microclimate at the site because in the case of our wall, the CRD, it really only receives rainfall during these wind-driven rainfall events, which means that there was a lot of challenges around plant survival when it wasn't getting as much water as we expected, um, which is always a bit of a challenge. So, of course, they help with the air quality and uh, conserving energy through temperature regulation, dampening noise pollution, protect the building facade, and uh, contributing to health and wellness as well. And of course, irrigation is key as we have found at our building. So permeable paving refers to porous asphalt, pervious concrete, interlocking pavers, grass creeks, and it works by allowing water to infiltrate where it falls, which means that fluids from cars and brake dust and all of this nasty stuff that comes off of our cars can stay where it is rather than being picked up and uh, transferred into our creeks and streams. And other benefits include um, reducing the need for road salt, according to a report by the Center for Neighborhood Technology. It could be by as much as 75%. And they also contribute to reducing the urban heat island effect because they absorb a lot less heat than conventional paving surfaces. So rain gardens and bioretention really are becoming a lot more commonplace. Um, you may have seen driven by this one on Blanchard Street at the Atrium Building and definitely added a lot to the streetscape. And there are many different types of rain gardens as well. They could be um, 
a rain garden, a planter, or a bioswale. And they're generally designed to be really site specific and you would be calculating the amount of water going into it in the design. So really they're just these sunken garden areas that surface water can be directed into, whether from rooftops, parking lots, sidewalks, or roads, and they really help with filtering out pollutants and slowing the flow of water. And it's really important to use amended soils as well for um, plant survival and uh, improving the plant growing conditions and increasing the amount of water that can be held in the soil. They're often designed to accept these smaller, more frequent rainfall events, like a two-year event, and generally an overflow is incorporated for those larger events. And uh, they aren't designed to have standing water in them. So water should generally infiltrate within two days. Uh, this is one of the rain gardens on Trenton Street, and this location is actually just up the street from Buckle Creek. And before the rain gardens were installed, the water actually ran downhill down the road directly into the creek, no treatment whatsoever at all. And now there are two rain gardens, one on either side of the road, and they accept uh, a lot of the runoff coming in, and they really reduce the amount of water going into the creek. And research by the University of Washington on rain gardens that were installed as part of the Seattle uh, Street Edge Alternative um, Initiative they show the following pollutant rates, which is pretty impressive. Mm. And I really think that rain gardens are the perfect example of multifunctional landscapes because they can really be integrated into the landscaping of a building rather than having these raised beds that we need to have an irrigation system for. It makes a lot more sense to have a sunken garden area where we direct rainfall into it and take advantage of this extra water reducing our need for irrigation. So by conserving the land on the site and reducing the footprint of our developments, it really is beneficial in rainwater management because it means we have so much more soil that's uncompacted and un untouched. And that means that so much more rainfall can infiltrate and be stored in the soil. So by maintaining and restoring green spaces, we also um, have a lot more community amenities and, and maintain our habitat, cor habitat corridors. So we also have opportunities for restoration of natural features, um, such as urban or suburban streams. So uh, in the case of the South Valley Drive development, they were able to um, actually build in a stream right through the middle of it. And that, of course, provides a great community amenity and adds to the habitat connectivity and reduces flooding risks. And by using the smaller building footprints, we, of course, reduce the amount of impervious surface on the site. So that means a lot more opportunities for recreation. So green streets actually pull together all of these, a lot of these different elements of the LID and uh, and they put it all into the design of a road. They have, there's a reduction of impervious areas because we use a narrower road surface. You can build bioretentions into the boulevard and uh, adding extra street trees. Permeable paving can be used. And usually there's the separation of vehicle traffic with the pedestrian cyclists. And they're often found to be a, a lot more cost effective as well. So it, at the um, C Streets project in Seattle, they found that on average they reduced the cost by 49% compared to conventional paving. And narrow streets, they also really slow down traffic, which helps to make them safer for cyclists and pedestrians. And they are also often a lot prettier too. So slowly, obviously, things are changing, but it really is because of the fact that there are all of these people like you guys out there who are really pushing the boundaries and driving change and looking for innovations and asking, is there a better way for us to do business? So for example, like Dockside Green, they've integrated so many of these um, ideas into the building. And so we know that change does happen quite slowly and what happens over 100 years or so 
generally can't be changed overnight, but, um, but it's great to see we're making so many changes. And going back to the living building challenge, uh, by integrating elements of low-impact development into our building and site designs, it means that it doesn't only help to sustainably manage rainwater, water, which helps for the water pedal in the living building challenge, but it also has impacts for the site, energy, equity, health, and beauty pedals too. So I'm really inspired to see the amount of sustainable rainwater management being integrated into buildings and integrated into projects. And I know with all of these innovations we're seeing, soon we'll, we will be starting to see these healthy, urban, functioning watersheds. So thank you very much.